We see the universe because of light. The light has to propagate through the universe to get to us. Einstein realized, in fact people before him realized, that light does not travel infinitely fast. It travels at a fixed speed. In fact, that fixed speed is the reason that we can see the ancient, or the early, I should say, the early universe. Because light has taken the entire age of the universe to travel across the universe to get to us, and we see it as it was shortly after the Big Bang. So light takes time to get to us. So in fact, I don't see any of you now. I actually see most of you that I can see in this room tonight. I'm seeing you a few nanoseconds ago. Because light took a few nanoseconds to get from you to my eyeball and my brain. It's an amazing thought. So the further away you are from me, the longer back in time I'm seeing you. The moon, for example, if a nasty alien grabbed the moon now, we'd see it shine for 1.2 seconds and the light would go out. Amazing thought. The moon, so we know this, is 1.2 seconds. You might not know some of the other ones though. You might know this one, of course, sun. If you're seeing the sun, if you look at the sun now, you know, carefully, uh, maybe the, through dusty clouds, the sun is being seen as it was eight minutes ago. If nasty aliens grabbed the sun, it would carry on shining for eight minutes before it went out. You heard it. Light will reach us from the sun in eight minutes. Therefore, these near light speed particles will reach a moonbound astronaut in little over eight minutes. As Ken Jeng states, there is no time to get undercover. Remember too, these solar storms are not predictable. Consider also that the cosmic rays will come from all sides, no matter where you point the service module. Not to mention the X-rays and gamma rays and secondary particles that bounce off the moon during particle collision and would come flying straight towards a moon-bound craft at the speed of light or near light speeds. When Ralph René began his investigation, he requested that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration send him the solar data for the years between 1968 and 1972, the years of the Apollo missions. They sent him pamphlets and several discs. Through his extensive analysis of the data files, René was able to uncover that 134 793 solar flares occurred between the years of 1967 and 1991. More than 1400 of them occurred between all nine moon missions combined. Plate and Windley both allege that all these solar flares were minor and therefore non-lethal. However, the two of them fail to mention that as early as 1963, NASA learned that even minor solar flares could give off doses of 25 rem per hour depending on how many centimetres of shielding was used. This is documented in Astronautical Engineering and Science, another publication Rene picked up on. The low energy flare of August 22nd, 1958 would have required a minimum of 2 centimetres to reduce the dosage to 25 rem per hour. Whereas the May 10th, 1959 flare, which was also low energy, needed 36 centimetres in order to reduce it to 25 rem per hour. With this information, let's take a look at all the solar storms that occurred during the Apollo missions. The record for the least flares absorbed during a visit to the moon was Apollo 17, with only 81 flares. The record for the most flares absorbed was Apollo 15, with a grand total of 268 flares. If Windley has been truthful that all flares during the Apollo missions were minor, it's a simple matter of calculating the radiation dosage that these astronauts would have received. Knowing that minor flares can give as much as 25 rem per hour 
astronauts Gene Cernan, Jack Schmidt, and Ron Evans would have received a dosage as high as 2,025 rem for the 12 days they spent on Apollo 17. Whereas David Scott, Jim Irwin, and Al Warden of Apollo 15 would have received a dose as high as 6,700 rem. This, of course, is assuming that each of those flares they encountered lasted a full hour. Some folks have argued that minor solar storms typically don't last much longer than tens of minutes, 30 at most. So for argument's sake, suppose that all the flares that occurred during the Apollo missions lasted in a time frame of tens of minutes. Using the 25 ram per hour figure, this means that for every 10 minutes, an astronaut is absorbing 4.16 rem. This sounds reasonable until you consider the number of flares that took place. If the Apollo 17 crew were bathed in 81 of these flares, they'd have got back with 337.5 rem. Apollo 15, with its record of 268 flares, would have given its crew a dosage as high as 1114.8 rem. Furthermore, we know that the April 17 flare was not brief. It lasted for three days. Even if the April 17 flare was minor, as the propagandist insists, at a dose rate of 25 rem per hour, this three-day solar storm would at most deliver 1,800 rem. This, of course, is not even including the radiation they would have picked up going through the Van Allen radiation belts. Minor solar storms would give people 25 rem per hour through a one centimeter thick aluminum hole. Now the holes on the lens were about 2,000 of an inch thick. Mm. <laughs> you know, that 25 rem figure must be much, much higher. But of course, uh, they would have you believe there were no solar storms during the periods these guys were in space. But they were, weren't they? Huh? But they were, weren't they? Oh, of course, my God, you don't, solar storms don't stop because Lyar Lavelle gets in a, a ship and orbits the Earth 20 times and says he wants to move them back. That ain't never gonna stop. And it is not true that all of those 1,400 flares were minor. In April 2008, YouTube user Unforgiven One checked the comprehensive flare index for major flares, which can be viewed on Noah's website. Before we check these records, let's hear Windley's response to the 1400 flares. This number represents the total number of detectable solar events, not major flares that would have posed a danger to the astronauts. The records also show that no major solar flares occurred during the Apollo missions, but the conspiracists don't care to look at that closely. Now let's check those very records, and see if it's true that no major flares occurred during Apollo. In total, there were nine lunar missions, six of which landed on the moon. Noah's CFI documents major flares that spurted between the years of 1955 and 1980. First, we have the historic Apollo 8 mission, which was launched on December 21st and splashed down on December 27th, 1968. Noah's records show that five major flares occurred during this mission. One on December 23rd, two on December 24th, one on December 25th, and one on December 27th. Second, we have the infamous dress rehearsal of Apollo 10, which lasted between the days of May 18 and May 26, 1969. Another five major flares occurred. One on May 19th, two on May 22nd, one on May 24th, and one on May 26. Third, Apollo 11, the first lunar landing, July 16th to July 24th, 1969. Only one major flare occurred during this mission, 
on July 19, 1969. Fourth, Apollo 12, launched on November 14 and returned on November 24, 1969. A grand total of eight major flares erupted during this mission. One on November 18th, three on November 19th, one on November 21st, one on November 22nd, one on November 23rd, and one on November 24th. Fifth, we have the so-called near disaster of Apollo 13 which ran from April 11 to April 17, 1970. Two major flares were recorded, one on April 13, the other on April 15.